Welcome. My name is Antoine Dandridge. I am the creator of Black Lifestyle Advocates for Culture and Knowledge. And I am very excited tonight because our fellow Kayla Collins um, is who's our policy and advocacy fellow, has done an amazing job at organizing an amazing presentation for the night, The Essence of a Black Uterus. Um, this is hosted by Kayla Collins and featuring uh, Sister Reach's very own Theron Bunn. Theron Bunn is a local activist in Memphis. She has done several, been a part of several uh, changes for justice around racial inequality or reproductive rights, reproductive justice, and the list can go on and on and on. Um, Theron is also an alumni of Tennessee State University, and she's just been an outstanding Memphian, and we're so glad to have her here tonight. Theron, thank you for being with us. And Kayla, thank you as well for curating an awesome uh, event tonight, and we cannot wait to dig in. But before we do, uh, we just definitely want to make sure we pay homage to both Sister Reach and Planned Parenthood who made this event, actually all of the events that we've done, very much so possible for all of you. And just remember, you know, show some love and respect for the people talking. Remember to mute your mics when you're not speaking. And guess what, y'all? After all this going on right now, we are in this all together. So let's continue to take care of each other, right? So what is reproductive justice versus reproductive rights? Um, Sister Reach is a reproductive justice organization. It's a 501 c 3 nonprofit organization that supports the reproductive autonomy of women, teens of color, poor and rural women, queer folks, their families through the framework of reproductive justice. And the mission of Sister Reach is to empower the base to lead healthy lives, raise families, and live in healthy and sustainable communities. Uh, Sister Reach worked from a four-pronged strategy of education policy advocacy, culture shift, and harm reduction. For more information, you can visit Sister Reach at www.sisterreach.org. Planned Parenthood, the mission of Planned Parenthood is to improve the health and well-being by providing high quality, non-judgmental sexual health care, honest and accurate sexuality education and reproductive health rights and advocacy. For more information, you can visit Planned Parenthood at www.pptnm.org as well as schedule an appointment for your reproductive needs. All right, so we have already done amazing introductions to both of our speakers tonight and we hope that you I have plenty of questions for them. All right, so Kayla, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you. Um, so again, I'm very excited to be here with you on this space tonight. Um, thank you for joining us as we try to make an impact changes within the black community. Um, again, tonight we'll be discussing the value of the black woman and the intersection that it has within the impregnator bill that is currently in review by policymakers. <clears throat> So we're gonna go ahead and dive in with the icebreaker. Um, so I will go ahead and start off the icebreaker. Um, with you chime in, just feel free to, you know, pick maybe one or two. Um, I would like a lot of people to kind of define um, essence or value in your own words, which is number one, but also you can just kind of pick another one um, on the list to kind of, you know, chime in um, on your opinion. So I'll start off, um, so define value. So to me, Value is the significance or importance of something or someone that I admire or feel that is special. So something that I think, um, for example, my mom, I value her. She's something special to me. Um, describe my self-value. So I believe that I'm an honorable young woman. I'm respectable. Um, I'm definitely goal-oriented and determined. And I feel like I can per persevere through any obstacle and I'm not quick to fold under pressure at all, <laughs> except for now. No, but... Um, Another one, how do I define a woman or value a woman, value of a woman? So women, I believe they're beautiful, they're bold. We're very multifaceted and opinionated. I think we're more realistic and goal oriented. And I also think that we're known as determined. Uh, we're also the caregivers and the nurturers. Um, so that is my response for the icebreaker. Uh, feel free if you would like to vocally chime in, um, you can go ahead and do so with pleasure. Um, if not, if you want to drop a couple things in the chat, um, you know, if you want to pick, like I said, one or two of the sentences or the statements to complete, you could go ahead and do so now. Mm 
Okay, so in the chat, we have Ari with Essence, the finest purpose. That is good. I definitely think that there's a good definition of what Essence is, kind of our purpose in life, um, the goals that we try to create. And like I said, the, you know, the goals that we have for something that is special to us. Okay, does anyone else have anything to add before we move forward? All right, well, if not, um, then Antoine, we can go ahead and get into the conversation. <clears throat> So if you could go ahead and one more slide, we're about to go ahead and dive into the conversation. All right, so we're gonna dig deeper into the definition of value and essence. So um, Google provided me with this definition that the definition of value is the regard that something is held to deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. It is also defined as a person's principles or standards of behavior or one's judgment of what is important in life. So the first question that I kind of want to start the conversation is why does society make it so hard for a woman to have the same freedom as men? So I'm going to go ahead and start by saying that I genuinely feel like some men can be threatened by the idea of a woman and the abilities that we may have to overpower the masculinity standards set forth by men. So what that means, simply put, is that we can basically run the show without necessarily needing their help or assistance. And I feel like that threatens some men into having the idea of wanting to have control over our autonomy, uh, autonomy and the decisions that we decide to you know, make. So as far as value of a Black woman, um, currently within our so, you know, society and social media, we're portrayed as angry, we're portrayed as bitter, um, loving. Some may refer to us as basic or a hose or gold diggers or easy, um, which decreases our value automatically. Not that we're not already black, not that, that we're already women, but also how we're also portrayed to others within society. And also there's a new focus on rape culture. Um, there's this new rape culture where women are, you know, viewed as going in these music videos, you know, we're out here we're basically sex sales, you know, that's all that the value of a black woman is. And so my question is, why aren't we valued more than just that as we are, you know, one of the, you know, America, the world's, you know, greatest, um, greatest assets. Um, so just kind of, if you want to chime into the conversation about the value of women and what do you think that the impact of social media and this newfound rape culture has um, on Black women and, you know, the choices that we are put through, the standards that we are put through, you are, you know, you can feel free to go ahead and chime in. I, I think as, as women, um, we know internally that we've always had the power and the power um, has always resided with us. Um, I think society and our environment sometimes dictate how our power um, shows up or how it's diminished in a particular moment. And sometimes we get totally off track. We have been put into some situations uh, where we may feel smaller or feel our worth is not recognized, even though that's not true. And so we just kind of cower down and society has told us to stay there. And it takes a lot more to build up than it does to get knocked down. And so when that happens so many times, we think that we've lost our power and it's just really about us um, realizing it again or coming to and really embracing that um, regardless of how it comes off. And so when you throw social media into the mix, um, for some of us, you know, Facebook, my particular generation um, on the older end of being a millennial, Facebook kind of came with us. And, you know, Instagram has come since then, Twitter, Snapchat, all these other things. But uh, Facebook started with us before Facebook, you had to go talk to people, you know, you had to send them an origami note um, in class, you had to call them on phone, maybe you left them a voicemail or whatever. And now there are so many other ways to communicate. 
and so many other ways to exchange information. And all those things reflect on um, how our power is interpreted and then how we're viewed. You know, everything is, is aesthetic focused, whether we like it or not, you know, we're judged on our hair, um, our weight, our height, you know, who we date, who we don't, who we're around, who our friends are. So there are all these things um, that try to dictate our power but we have to we have to continue to do our own inner work for us to know that we have the power we always had the power and it's on us how we distribute it despite um of what happens in our environment right i definitely agree with that <clears throat> and just to picking back what you were saying about social media uh, most definitely like i said with this newfound rape culture um, I feel like women are more so portrayed and now that we have this idea that we have to have this specific body shape or we have to have, you know, the nice nails and the nice hair all the time or, you know, different, you know, different assets and different things that, you know, that's not really true to being a true woman. And I feel like it just definitely lessens the true value that we have to give. And I think that sometimes we can even get so set in that mindset um, of wanting to kind of be accepted by society that we forget our own true value. So I definitely agree with that. And um, I want to, and you, you reminded me of something. Um, it's interesting what we see portrayed, you know, in our friend circles and um, our media environments versus what we may see on social media or TV, because there is this perception um, about let's say video girls right but the funny thing about it is if you look at me you'll never know I was in a music video I was in a couple of them I ain't have to shake my ass and I ain't have to be half naked to be in them but I was in them things and I got a check for them um and so that I would say in that sense I'm a person who defied what the typical perception um, of a video girl is and I think as we continue to see examples that defy perception then that opens up people's minds to what can and cannot be and what reality is um you know amongst amongst other black women as well yes definitely definitely um and so even in in those situations um how do you feel about I guess necessarily like women for example, Meg Thee Stallion. Everyone loves Meg Thee Stallion, knows Meg Thee Stallion. Um, Meg Thee Stallion is actually a very intelligent woman, but she embraces herself. She embraces, you know, who she is. You know, she's fine with twerking. She doesn't care about it. She doesn't care about who's watching, who has anything to say. And so it's kind of, my question is, so how do we, you know, differentiate that line of it's me, you know, like that's just who I am. I'm being myself and, you know, being afraid because for example, um, I'm a very outgoing person. I'm a Leo. I love to have fun. But, you know, in the setting that I'm in, I'm in a sorority. You know, I'm getting, I'm a graduate student. You know, I'm a fellow. I have all of these things going to where I feel like I can't portray myself like that in social media. I feel like instantly I will be, you know, judged about my character and my, my value and my worth and what I can bring to the table. So more so, how do you feel like we can eliminate that, that line of, you know, I guess judgment or perception. I don't think that's something that's going away. I think we have to embrace where our personal truths are. If if you want to take the Meg Thee Stallion example, if you like to twerk and shake your ass, you know, who are you worried about and what are you worried about them saying, right? Are you worried <laughs> about getting your money or are you worried about what um, people think of you? Are you worried about what the world thinks of you, you know? what's important because we all have people that we intentionally go to um <clears throat> opinions from but guess what those opinions are judgments we just sought them out so we're judged by everything we do it's just a matter of how much weight um that holds in our life and how important that is to us you know it might be stuff let's say i call a personal friend about and they're gonna give me an opinion but if I walk in Kroger with that same outfit on, I might get a different unwarranted opinion, right? So it's about what matters to me. I probably, I'm going to say with me knowing some people on here and maybe not knowing everybody, uh, I think it would be fair to say that the people that um, know me on this call or have ever seen me ever before, no, I am a person who is highly controversial 
and judge a lot. I'm judged from what I say, when I say it, how I say it, to who I say it, um, how I went about saying it, all those things. But my thing is I will shut up um, when I'm wrong um, or when I'm lying or when it becomes unhelpful to somebody who is fearful of raising their voice. And so far we ain't made it there yet. So I have to understand it in my particular position, um, I am risking more judgment than normal by virtue of what I do and how I navigate the world. It's not fun and it's not fair, but I know it's a part of my personal process and journey. In that, I also know that the work that I do impacts people that I may never meet, that may never get the opportunity to tell me thank you, that I may never physically see what the impact is like. And for me, that's what it's about. So I care less about the worldly judgment because I care very deeply about the impact of people that will benefit from the work that I do. Hey, Karen, I, just, I want to intercede with a question for you. How do you. That's a very interesting point that you um, brought up. I mean, I love how that you were able to explain that, okay, I realize my, how I'm viewed from the outside looking in. And I also know myself from the inside looking out. Where, how did you develop that level of comfort? Where did you get that level of, of confidence to continue with that and, and walk in that and own it? Oh, you know, I want to be real funny and say I drink a lot and I smoke a lot, but I don't. Um, I'm not a big drinker. I'll have a glass of wine or a cocktail. Um, You're not a big drinker. I do know that much. I had 420 on days other than 420. Um, but you know, it took a lot of it took a lot of tears. It took a lot of understanding about what mattered to me. Um, you know, people are going people are always gonna have something to say. So why do I let it bother me? If I let it bother me today from you. Why am I going to let it bother me from somebody else a month from now? And they're saying the same thing. Who cares? Like, what are they doing? And that's always going to be my question. When you outdoing me with the work, then I will care about what you have to say. And if you are not adding money to my bank account or value to my life, then I don't care about the judgment that you're offering to me. It's a hard place to be in. It's not easy because there's always a certain level of fear that... I may rub somebody that I really care about the wrong way, but ultimately I am so comfortable in myself. I have found that people who seek out those folks that are like me know exactly what they're getting, even in my current capacity, right? Um, I know when we deal with um, C3s and C4 organizations, you deal with board members and typically those board members are um, the governing body for your CEO or your founder or executive director. Well, when I got my particular role, the first question I said is, will your board let you hire me? Um, because I knew why I was being brought into the fold, but I also knew that there were people making decisions past my direct report. So what does that mean? And there was a conversation about that, but ultimately the people that are impacted by this, it shows up in the craziest ways. Like sometimes it's shown up in a mystery cash app. Sometimes it's shown up with um, something being sent to my house. Like there's stuff that's been sent to me that I still don't know. Sometimes it shows up in a thank you letter. Sometimes it shows up with, you know, somebody who got put out their house, you know, getting their own apartment, getting the keys to their first car. It shows up in different ways. And I have to know that what's important to me is the legacy I leave to know that the next person who has a situation or an experience is not going to endure the hard parts um, of what I did. And I have, you know, I have a lot of friends and I know friend is a term that we in our generations use very loosely. But when I mean, I got some friends, I ain't always had them, but my friends are rock solid. Like my friends will go to jail about me. My friends will drop some serious cheese about me. My friends will come see me on my worst day. When I was sick, I've had friends literally wipe my ass so when I say I trust my friends and they I, they trust me that's who has my back if there's never a day that goes by if I experience something that I can't take somebody like I'm having the day from hell can you come over can we go get ice cream whatever it is and it's being able to have friends that understand it might be 
four out of seven days this week, but zero days the next couple of weeks following. But knowing that that support is always going to be there, whether it's one friend or five and being comfortable yeah. in that and being comfortable as much as I don't like to be alone, being comfortable being alone and knowing that it won't always be like this and that this is a moment but tomorrow is another one to improve upon whatever didn't go right the day before wow that was so well answered i mean when i said you hit every nail on the head, one thing you definitely can do is answer questions so uh thank you for the answer i feel like this is a side to you that you don't get to like share much so I really appreciate the depth and like the humility of that because if you literally talk about someone having to wipe your tail when you were down. And I think when people see people like you that are so strong, we don't think that you can even be a person who would allow someone to do that. But what you're saying is the reason why I get to be strong is because I also know how to be weak. If I have, I'm, I'm going to go through it. If I'm going through it, I'm going to go through it. And then I'm going to build myself up from it. I'm going to utilize the support. I'm going to trust who I need to trust and the people are there because they know why they're there so it's this kind of ties back into what kayla's talking about when we talk about how women are perceived so you would you would also say to agree that we would you also agree that it's important for women to stand firm and and who they will be as you know women and be concerned about the legacy they're going to leave versus how people judge them and see them Absolutely. I think if you, and, and this is probably going to be real extreme, I think if you're, you know, the nice pushover, own being a nice pushover. If you the super bitch, baby, own that. If you if you the, the $40 hoe, own being the $40 hoe. Whatever your thing is, whatever it is that you know is your true self that you can own, be the best at that. Because I can tell you, there are some people who think I'm extremely intimidated. I'm a bitch. I'm mean. I'm very impactful and I'm highly effective. So I'm going to be that bitch, but I'm going to be that <laughs> highly impactful, very effective bitch any day of the week. And so whatever that means for you, don't let anybody tell you differently as long as it's true. When you begin to be inauthentic, now we got to have some other conversations, right? But as long as you are being true to yourself and authentic about how you present yourself to the world, everything else will fall in place um, like it's supposed to. Whether you you believe in, in God or something else or whether you don't believe in anything at all, everybody has something that they look to or get energy from. And whatever that is, if it's true to you and it shows up in the world, that's all that matters. Um, so own it, you know, own being, you know, what's this? I'm a hundred and I think I'm, I might be a hundred, a little less than 196 pounds right now. You'll never think I'm almost 200 pounds. That's some real stuff. The lowest I've been in my adult life is 133 pounds. Now, true enough, they had to do with illness, but I own that. I'm finna own every ounce of this extra fat on my body and these double Ds and walk around and you can't tell me nothing. You hear me the same way I'm gonna do it when I'm 133 pounds. I'm a little bit smaller, a little less thick. I'm gonna own it. My confidence is ridiculous. Do you hear me? Because you can't do me better than me. And you can't mm -hmm. walk in my truth better than me. And that's how people need to continue to show up in the world. So when people try mm -hmm. to devalue you, if they're not authentic themselves, they can't take away from the, your value. They can't devalue you. Mm. Uh, this is excellent. I, I'm, I'm, I just cannot wait to hear some of your point of views on some of the other questions that Kayla has, because I think this is gonna also talk about how some of these uh, things that we're talking about can impact the, the essence of a uterus for black women. Right. Yes, definitely. So before we uh, move on to um, allowing you to introduce the impregnator bill and your opinions and questions that I have on that bill as well, um, kind of piggyback off, piggybacking off of Antoine's question. So like, what advice would you give a black woman who may be lost um, in their in their era or may not be as comfortable standing up for themselves? Because you know that we do have those women who are, you know, timid, those women that are shallow, those women who cannot stand up for themselves. Um, for example, that, you know, some women that are putting emotional or abusive, you know, domestic abusive, whatever type, physical abusive, you know, those type of relationships, 
um, how, what advice would you give someone to be able to get that type of confidence? Because the type of confidence that you have, the way that you see life, that's how I see life, to be honest. I'm a person, I kind of feel like, hey, nobody tell me what, what to do, how I'm going to do it. I don't care that I don't have this big Coke body shape. Like I have just as much value as this, you know, these Instagram models. I'm just as smart and I'm definitely going to get into that bag with you just as, you know, much, you know, the girls that are, you know, what, what everyone portrays us to be, you know, these just basic hoes that don't care about nothing but a bag and a dollar and all of that. Um, so what, you know, the women who aren't, you know, as strong as us or as, or as capable um, to stand up for ourselves, like what advice would you give them or how would, how would you sway that? Like, how would we sway this to where women are comfortable living in their truth? Like, how can I go and impact another woman to, to take the same stance as me? Yeah. Um, the first thing I would say is if, if they want to have a conversation to reach out to me, I'm I'm real good about one-on-one -on -one conversations. I be empowering people and saving lives on the daily in between everything else I do. And I think that's part of my contribution back to my community is passing along the lessons and knowledge um, that I've learned or gone through. Um, and then I would also say, find something that motivates you. So for me, I've never taken a job based on what um, the hourly rate or the salary is. Never. I don't, I don't, I rip, to be honest, I don't care about it. I mean, yes, I know I have bills. Yes, I know I have responsibilities. I got medical bills, all these things, but I care about being happy in my workspace. So for me, I am personally guided by being in a workspace where I am comfortable and I have flexibility and I can be 100% my authentic self whether that's being the director of policy and advocacy, whether that's managing content for somebody, whether that's working on a TV production, whether that's writing a book, um, whatever that is, I want to be happy in my space. And so I will find out what motivates you. So for me, um, I like to, I like candles and I like a nice handbag and I'm a sneaker head. So in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm not working to pay my bills. That's going to happen. I'm working because I know, uh, matter of fact, today I bought some Reebok Candyland sneakers. I knew that was going to be about $75. So I know, okay, well, I'm not going to go eat two or three times because I want to make sure I can buy these sneakers. That's my motivation. I know it's a $400 Marc Jacobs bag that I've been wanting for a long time. That's my motivation. I'm going to work towards it. So me having something to work towards and look forward to changes everything that I do so in order to do that okay maybe I have to take some speaking engagements maybe it's five maybe they pay a hundred dollars a piece well my shoes only 75 my bag for a hundred so now I didn't take five um speaking engagements and I paid for all of the things that I said that I wanted so you have to find what motivates you and then find something that makes you feel feel beautiful or or nice or happy or brings joy so like right now um I've I've actually been more intentional about putting on makeup but right now it's been a crazy day so I don't have much on but for somebody it may be some lip gloss it may be the color of their hair um it may be buying a nice shirt for an interview you have to figure out what fuels you that's what I was trying to get to what fuels you well, fusual is what is what will guide you and what will boost your confidence. Um, and it's different for everybody else. For some people, it's going on a date. For some people, it's eating a special meal. For some people, it's getting some pants that fit. You know, it's different for everybody, but being able to be free in your own self, knowing that regardless of whether it goes right or wrong, whether it lasts all day, whether it lasts for a moment, whatever you're dealing with, going through, about to tackle, that it may or may not last forever, depending on how that flows with what you're doing. But you have to be comfortable. You have to be able to sleep at night. Not your partner, you. Because your partner can go away. Your friends may not always be there. Your parents, um, your relatives, anybody in your circle. But at the end of the day, you came in this world by yourself. You have to exit this world by yourself. And so you have to be okay. And just constantly, you know, some people put post-it notes on the, 
post-it notes are affirmations. I have a lot of friends that do that. And it says, I am beautiful. I am great. I am enough. We got a group chat where we do that. And we send affirmations like whatever that thing is that brings you joy, find that and find out what motivates you. You know, Theron, you bring up a good point about like being clear, like with yourself, no, like whether your partner or family agrees. And you know, I think between the three of us, we've had enough partner relationship issues to know. <laughs> I'm just joking. But <laughs> the funny thing <laughs> is, like, <it's> also, <laughs> it can also be like a very isolating place while you're going through that thing that separates you and sort of isolate you. Uh, how, what are some tools you can give folks for healing through that? Because I think that's going to be a great tool as people begin to learn to protect themselves and step out and protect some of these bills that we'll talk about later. Music. And I'm sorry. Can I piggyback on that question? Because he kind of stole my question, but it's okay. What? <laughs> um, so I, I want to piggyback on that. And even so, like with his current uh, question, also kind of explaining how you would do that with people who are in risky situations, such as domestic violence, or, you know, those women who are promiscuous and put themselves in these incidences with like bad one night stands, or, you know, those who suffer from different, you know, mental illnesses, or even when we talk about, you know, socioeconomic statuses, like how does, you know, suffering for poverty, like those type of situations, um, like what tools would you, you know, give women to, to be able to, you know, heal from that. So on the first one, I'm gonna say if, if you were someone, I feel like the 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 messages that come on TV, if you are someone you know, um, but if you are someone you know is experiencing a um, a domestic violence situation, um, uh, please reach out. Um, to me or the contact form on Sister Reach's website um, because we do have a partner organization called Walking Into a New Life that is run by um, Ms. Joyce and it deals directly uh, with resources for domestic violence victims. So that's number one. Um, as far as um, all the other um, groupings that you you mentioned, um, you know, I've been homeless myself two or three times. I've slept in my car. I didn't had all my stuff in one space, nowhere to go. So I've been there. Um, so I can tell you from firsthand experience, um, you know, it's about embracing the moment. It's a part of your story, right? Oftentimes we only see the highlight reels. We see all the really, really good, shiny, fancy, um, celebratory things, right? And that's not everything. That's the highlights. That's the good stuff. But what about the bad moments? And the thing about a bad moment is however you come out of that may help somebody else to get out of theirs. Mm -hmm. and so we often get trapped in saying we don't want to share our story. We're ashamed. We're afraid. We're afraid of being judged, right? Um, but we never know how that's going to help the next person. Um, when I went through chemo, which is a very um isolating thing can't nobody else had it that that uh juice running through their veins but you somebody can sit there with you and hold your hand but ultimately it's you and what really helped me in that moment was music i can say music has gotten me through anything um celebratory it's a song for something something sleeping in my car it's a song for something a bad breakup i can give you a song for almost anything and almost always it's already built into a playlist it'll come up in like a a similar to listen to type of thing same way people you may know on facebook that same thing in your uh, music app music really is the most universal thing there is next to love and you know whether it's r&b pop country blues jazz that's what gets me because the lyrics hit you different when you going through something, but you can listen to that song on repeat until you get out of your situation. And so for me, um, that's honestly something that gets me through and also making myself completely free and available to change because whatever got you in that situation is not something you want to repeat, but you have to be open to things being different. Oftentimes we, some, we get complacent in saying, we like this, we enjoyed this, we didn't like how it ended, but we wanna go back. You gotta go forward. Sometimes you have to become a slingshot and revert back to propel forward, but you also have to be open to that. Everything is about forward movement. Every day that we go by, that goes by, we get older. So every day that goes by, we should be getting better too. Mm. Boy. 
I like that. I feel like I'm talking to like a better me, right? <laughs> like <laughs> it's so, it's so, it's just, it's crazy. That's crazy. I think just like that. So um, without further ado, we are going to wrap up the conversation about the value of women. And we're going to go ahead um, and give you the floor once more to speak on the impregnator bill. So, um, you know, what the easiest way to talk about this bill or to characterize it is men sticking their nose where it don't belong. So ultimately, uh, ultimately what this bill does in as clear layman terms as possible, it basically gives permission for anybody that identifies as male to have say over what a woman does with her body. So for example, um, and if I was pregnant and I was gonna have um, an abortion, Antoine could come and say, well, I'm the baby daddy. I don't want her to have no abortion. And guess what? Antoine would now have, as it currently stands, um, assuming that there are no additional amendments filed or that would be adopted. Antoine would be able to tell me that he's the daddy and then he now has paternal rights to that child. Now, what also has not been included is DNA testing. So as this bill currently stands, you do not have to provide DNA evidence while the child is in utero or once the child has come into this world should uh, an abortion, miscarriage, or other, other means of not carrying the child to full term take place, right? And it basically would create chaos in the state, right? It would allow an ex, it would allow, um, you know, an ex-husband, an ex-boyfriend, an ex-best friend, anybody that identifies as male can state claims to your child um, and maintain paternal rights, but not necessarily paternal responsibility. So there's nothing currently in the bill that says, as long as you are, as long as you are, proclaiming paternal rights, that you also are claiming paternal responsibility, which means you can say you the daddy, but I can't necessarily collect child support from you. I can't ask you for anything else, but you get to tell me what to do. So one, it's wrong for all of those reasons, um, but it's also wrong because as a person carrying a child, you are the only person who gets to make the decision. Oftentimes, we often say you, uh, the decision is made between you and your physician, and that's true, but your physician's um, place is only to provide you with the medical advice, the, the pros and cons, here's the information, here you go, take it. But the decision relies with that woman. Um, and despite whatever reason a woman chooses to carry a child to full term or not, that decision should only reside with that woman, period, no questions asked. Um, but this, this is married with a series of hateful bills that our legislative body is proposing. So we're calling it the slate of hate. And so the slate of hate consists of all these things that take away from women's bodily autonomy and a slew of um, anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ bills. Um, but this one is bad. Um, we've actually, Senator Pody, um, Sister Reach actually met with Senator Pody for our Black folks day on the hill. And we discussed this bill specifically um, with him. And you know, there were several questions about what about if it's a case of rape? What about if it's a case of incest? And there are no provisions, which is sad. Um, additionally, things that you have to know about the legislators pushing these bills are one, on the House side, you have Jerry Sexton carrying the bill. And then on the Senate side, you have Mark Pody. Both of these legislators live in rural counties, both of them, right? Jerry Sexton is in Bean Station and Mark Pody is in Lebanon, I believe. And Jerry Sexton is the same Tennessee representative that is pushing for the Bible to become the official book of the state. Um, he also was one of the sponsors of 
the anti-trans sports bill that passed, um, the Teachers Discipline Act passed, which for those of you don't know, is basically where it gives permissions um, to an educator to put a child out of class um, if they are experiencing discipline issues or um, classroom disruption. Um, he also proposed Amazing Grace be the state song, only the Dolly Parton version, right? So it's extremely whitewashed. And he also currently has a bill going through committee um, that deals with um, anti-hormone therapy for LGBTQ minors so that they can acknowledge that. That gives you an idea of that legislator, right? And then Senator Pauly has also been a sponsor for the fetal heartbeat bill and the anti-trans sports bill. That gives you an idea of how these very mediocre white men think. Now, if you really get into the weeds about who this legislation will affect the most, it really has probably affected white men and women the most. They just not going to tell you. It's not public facing, right? It's very, very, very. So on the surface, Black folks are the people who will be most impacted. As much as we, we know about sometimes mothers being absent in our community, sometimes fathers being absent in our community, regardless of whether the general public believes that or not, if I get ready to say, I don't wanna have my, my child, it ain't nobody else's decision. Nobody else should have a say. Certainly not somebody who is not intent on being a part of the pregnancy process, should I continue, or that child's life going forward. I love that. You actually educated me on the part. I did not know that about that bill. Um, the fact that there has to like there's no required DNA testing and kind of just anyone can up and say that. I don't even like I don't even understand who would even want to advocate for a bill as such. That makes no sense um, to me at all. Um, so what are what are some of the red flags that you think will come with the placement of this policy? Like if this policy is pushed, how do you you know what are some red flags that you think will happen? And also how do you think it will change you know the risky situations that women encounter especially black women such as domestic violence rape sexual assault incest um in those situations how do you think that that will you know impact or change our lives um i definitely think it's going to lead to lots and lots and lots of litigation um i think it's going to lead to um the state getting sued 100% and then if for whatever reason we you know it still supersedes that process what you'll see is women um, who deal with men who challenge this or who try to um, implement this in their particular situation um, you'll unfortunately have women that are stuck um, because they may not be able to afford um, an attorney or any subsequent legal fees um, they may not want the headache they may not be able to do something as simple as take off of work to go to the court hearing. Um, it puts our communities at a severe imbalance and a, an extreme injustice, um, which is what Republican legislators tend to do. They don't care about the after effects. They don't care about the aftermath. They don't care about our opinions. They care about, they want to pass this bill to look good. They want to make sure that Tennessee remains one of the most conservative states in this country. And every bill that they propose adds up to that, right? Um, I can't say that it will stop I definitely think it's not going to stop people from having sex. I definitely don't think it's going to prevent people from getting pregnant any more than they do now. Um, I can't say that it will make people second guess whether or not they choose to carry their child to term. Because again, that's a personal decision. And despite this bill being in place, that's not, that's not going to change how people move. It might change how they react, but not their decisions on the, on the front end. Um, I think that it is extremely hateful. Um, I think that it will, it creates kind of like an open door for men to be spiteful. You know, for that bad ex that couldn't stand you, that talked about you like a dirty dog, now you pregnant. Oh, let me go interrupt her life some more. I think that's what it's gonna do. I think it's going to be a gateway for men to further have um, perceived control over women and their bodies. 
And I think it is the absolute wrong direction for um, our state to go. Um, for sure. I see, yeah, for abusers to, yeah, it gives them an extra layer of comfort um, to further abuse women for sure. And it's extremely unfortunate. So um, when we see bills like this come through, what we have to do better about is organizing around it and being very clear about what the, what the points are. This bill takes away women's rights to decide what to do with their body. Simple and not necessarily get lost in, in the weeds of all the intricacies, but hey, this is the clear message. And then being willing to have conversations with these legislators, like I can tell you, Jerry Sexton is a pill. That's, that's a, yeah, that's a hard conversation to have, but you should still make the attempt. However, Senator Mark Pody, even though he passes some of the most harmful bills in the state legislature, he real nice. He gonna talk to you like this. He gonna be willing to listen to you. He gonna say, oh yeah, you know, I'll take that into consideration. He gonna be real nice about it, but his votes are harmful. But we still have to be willing to sit down and have some of these tough conversations, even though they are extremely triggering. I think that was one of the hardest things for me to do for our black folks down on the hill is make it clear to folks that, hey, you know, yes, we're going to talk to people that are allies, but we're also going to have to talk to people that are harmful to us to make sure that they understand just how deep this is for us and just how much this impacts us. Most definitely. And so um, just saying that the bill does pass and this, you know, become, goes into legislation, how do you think that that's going to impact, you know, social economic statuses? And also, how do you think that's going to impact children? Because in my opinion, I definitely feel like that that's going to create a space for more children to be abused, uh, more children to be, you know, in poverty, more children to be, you know, in these urban settings with, you know, bad education and, you know, just kind of all these limited barriers. And then on top of that, you have parents that didn't necessarily want you. You're just kind of here out of spite. Um, so how do you how do you feel? Do you, would you agree with that? Or do you think, you know, how do you what's your stand on? the impact that this bill could have on, you know, if passed on children and, you know, social economic statuses. Absolutely. Um, it definitely will put um, women in a very um, precarious position. It'll make things really, really tough because as much as we would like to say um, um, most women have that um, motherly instinct, everybody doesn't and it's okay um and you know what does that mean for that child that mother who has to have that child and you know they didn't want that child but they feel obligated to you know to feed that child and clothe that child and you know provide educational opportunities for that child knowing in the back of their head that's not what they wanted and yes um, in life, we have to do some things that we just merely don't want to do, but it should never be at the expense of a child who, who did not ask to be here, but who is here because, you know, we had some stupid ass legislators. Um, but what we have to do is, one, when we see things like this coming, we have to prepare for the worst while hoping for the best. Like we gotta hope this bill don't pass, but we also gotta say, should it pass? What does that mean for making resources available uh, for women who do have children? What does that mean for making sure there are the least amount of barriers to any subsequent medical costs? What does that mean for making sure that mother has transportation to take the child to follow-up appointments? What does that mean to make sure they have access to um, a safe living environment, um, you know, healthy foods? We have to think through all of these things because they're not. And so it puts the burden on us to one, really, really bear down with community and really lean on people that we might otherwise not need to or not think about because that's who's here for us. That's who understand. And that's all of us. Like it's on us. It really is one of those we all we got situations because we are supposed to be able to go to legislators and say, this is what we want, fix it and change it. But these are not the type of legislators that are gonna do that. Like this isn't helpful to anyone. This bill shouldn't even exist. On top of it being harmful, it doesn't promote anything. It doesn't make anything healthier, wealthier or more wise. So why does it even exist, period, regardless of who it may affect. 
but now we know the ramifications based on the communities that it will affect the most will be extremely damaging. And so we have to make the phone calls, we have to make the emails, and then when we get really into the weeds, we got to get people to vote. I know some people don't like to hear that. Um, I know some people aren't excited about that process. I also understand everybody may not have their rights to vote. And that's, you know, something that we have to have discussions about. But for those of us that do, there are multiple steps in this process that we can begin to utilize so that we never get here again. So that we never have to worry about these types of bills because there aren't legislators there proposing those bills. There are legislators there proposing proposing helpful bills, and those are the types of people that we want. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I guess the wrap up question. Um, so what do you suggest are some good action steps just for like your average person in the community, your average black woman or and or male um, to raise awareness about this bill um, because. I had no knowledge of this bill and being in policy, you know, until, you know, approaching this fellowship. Um, so um, what are some good action steps um, to raise awareness about this bill and the negative impact it can have on women? Um, you know, I have to, I don't know the date that is going through committee. I know it's got to be really soon because session is almost over. I would definitely say, um, call your legislators, email your legislators. I know we, I know sometimes it's, that proves to be difficult for some of us, but mm -hmm. I definitely talked to a legislator about their um, vote regarding the anti-trans sports bill and whether or not what they told me is the truth, what they said was nobody emailed me about the bill. And so we think everybody's emailing and calling them, but not as much, not as, much as we'd expect. And so email them, call them. If you have their personal numbers, text them. I do. I text them while they're on the House and Senate floor if I got a problem with what they're about to do. That's just me, though. Um, but reach out, tweet them. So many of them are active on Twitter. So many of them talk about all these things on Facebook. Talk to them. Tell them you don't want them to vote this way on the bill. The thing is, you're one person, but maybe it took you speaking out to motivate somebody else to do so, to motivate somebody else and so on and so forth. And so now we've collectively garnered all our impact and said, we don't want this. So it's kind of like, you know, individually, we may have some impact, but together we can strike a mighty blow. And that's what we have to do every single time. We have to hit these hard bills tough every single time. And, you know, between Planned Parenthood and Sister Reach, we have things like every action. We have things like constant contact where we can send out support letters, signers. Here's the template. Put your name in here. We have to be able to do these things every single time something like this. Like, we have to let them know we're always watching. Right. And that should they continue to propose bills like this, then it will affect their elections and their re-elections later. You know, Darren, that's a really good point. I, I love the action step piece. And um, thank you so much, Kayla, for asking that question. I think, because uh, I'm a huge fan of it, I believe we can always, it's good to talk about the issues, but let's talk about what we need to do next. Uh, Darren, you spent a significant amount of time at Capitol Hill, on Capitol Hill in Nashville. Um, what is the presence of Black folks like on the Hill on a regular basis? It ain't. <laughs> uh, simply put, it ain't. Um, yeah. I would say even before COVID, if you look at a lot of the legislative assistants, most of them, I would say maybe 60% are younger white women. I think some of the black legislators have at least one or two black staffers. Um, but walking around and talking to the legislators, it's not many of us. Even when some of the white led organizations go, it's maybe two or three or four of us sprinkled in that mix. Um, but our presence is not as heavy as it should be. And it's funny that you say that because um, I was talking to my CEO and executive director right before this. And I was like, I plan on spending significant time in Nashville next year. I plan on giving witness testimony to bills. I plan on rallying around some of these bills and getting with collaborative organizations to do so. People need to feel us. And I think that's what's been missing for some of these bills is people go sit in the gallery, you know, a handful of people go meet with their legislators. But what does that mean for us to come out in droves 
the way they took over people's plaza last year what does that mean for groups of five of us to go talk to every sponsor of the bill every co-sponsor of the bill and constantly doing so until it goes through committee until it hits the house floor and then when it goes into the other chamber doing the same thing it's extremely exhausting but that's going to be the difference in us saving and improving um lives with some of this legislation oh Darren, i love that because you know earlier you was like you spoke about voting being a powerful tool and i think a a lot of people think, okay, I voted. I did my part. I stood in the rain. I stood in the line. But what you're talking about is deeper level engagement. Uh, how impactful have you seen that work out when people really show up and stay on top of those legislators over bills that could be harmful to Black people or people in Tennesseans in general? Yeah, it's, you know, every, it's kind of like the multiplication equation you know, one times three times three times three, and then we exponentially increase our reach. And we have to continue to do that. When we actually unify around stuff, we're ridiculously impactful and we get stuff done. The problem is we get so stuck in our silos. We get so stuck in being, being tired or being stretched thin or being at capacity or, you know, just wanting to go to happy hour, not wanting to be bothered. But guess what? In the midst of all that, legislation is still being passed. Elections are still happening. Regardless of COVID, guess what? An election still happening. We still got over 120 things that are going to be on Shelby County's ballot next year. So what's up? We going to wait. Are you going are you going to be on one of those ballots in Tennessee next year? I will. I have been consulting for some candidates, but I will not be on there. Never again. Um, I have done that and tried that and have found that I am more impactful not being there because I can say what I want. Um, but but no, um, there are opportunities for us to do that. We just have to be willing to. We have to be willing to work with people that we may not like every other day of the week, but they real good at this. So we're going to use everybody's talents cohesively to make things better for this state. Wow, this is amazing. Thank you so much for that there. Kayla, back to you. Thank you, yes. Um, so that kind of wraps up our discussion with the impregnator bill so we can move forward with our presentation. And thank you again, Ms. Aaron. That was absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. Well, right now, Kayla, it looks like it's time to speak truth to power. Let's talk about yeah. it. So um, I kind of just want to see how everyone's feeling discussing this topic um, and if there's anything that any that resonated with anyone um, specifically, um, you know, so I'm going to step back and allow you all to chime in. Please unmute your mics. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Is, is this Ari? Yes. <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey, how are you? I can't put my camera on because I'm not slaying right now and this is recorded. We totally understand. <laughs> my wife Ari is one of our fellows. She uh, has an event coming up uh, tomorrow called Dear Black Women, The Boo or the Bag. So, hey, Ari, I'm going to check that for us today. Okay, so um, first of all, Kayla, good job. Thanks for yeah. the, the education theory. Um, but I just want to say, just speaking on the whole topic, um as a black woman black person really but just speaking from a, a black woman's point of view us constantly fighting this uphill battle um to just like tell our own stories um make our own truth understood respected heard is really really hard and just speaking to theron's point where she was saying how exhausting the work is i think that part of the systematic oppression is to essentially make our journey so difficult that when it is time to do the work we're fucking exhausted like um and I think that that plays into it and then when you're talking about a black woman in relation to um hold on baby <laughs> in relation to our autonomy and um our reproductive rights it's like um we go into these medical spaces where people are already assuming we're exaggerating, assuming that we're somebody's um, illegitimate baby mama, assuming all of these things about us. Um, and 
it, you just get tired of fighting. Um, and especially in a time like this where we're still having certain conversations, we're getting verdicts of accountability, turning around and getting news of somebody else getting murdered. And it's like, how do you fight for something that seems small as, uh, an abortion right whenever you're going through all that it's it seems like a smaller thing even though it's not when you're dealing with it on an everyday basis and it's like I want I hope that one day or one days we can really find a place to just be able to take deep breaths and figure out how to like balance it all and even better than that stop having to balance so much of of the micro and macro aggression like it would just be nice to take that shit off our plate just just period <laughs> that would be a dream to just wake up and like have the privilege of just being a human being and going through regular shit without oh i'm black as well like being mm -hmm. an issue <laughs> like, you know it's so interesting I, I don't even i could even imagine what that could feel like right sometimes. I, at all. I know it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's almost an Right, Kayla. It's almost like an optimist idea. Yeah, it's like ridiculous. It's like taboo. Which is right. I said it's kind of like taboo, like the com you know, the feeling of being comfortable being myself just based off the color of my skin is just completely fucking taboo. Like I feel like I can I can't go and be this like I can't even be angry. You know, if I get upset about something that a white woman would get upset about, I'm automatically, you know, this angry, bitter, aggressive, you know, tor you know, tormenting person. And, it, you know, that's just something that I can never like. It's like, when are we ever going to just be able to be comfortable? And that's why I am more of a radical individual. I'm more of a Malcolm X than a Martin Luther King, because, I mean, I feel like we have to do more than just, you know, talk about it. You know, you have to actually act on it in order for us to get, you know, equality and justice so yeah i definitely appreciate everyone being here tonight and um you know putting in your um your participating in the conversation does anyone have anything else that they would like to add to the conversation before we wrap it up well, well if nobody has anything else i would like to say um First of all, thanks for all of our guests who's attended throughout the entire, you know, program today. Uh, we hope this has been helpful to you. Um, definitely look out for an opportunity to share this with friends and family at some point. Um, I would like to thank Theron for our guest for an amazing contribution of knowledge, experiences, and just sharing her true testimony of what it takes to do this work on a daily basis. We're so thankful for her and all the work that she does. Uh, and Kayla, last but not least, um, you have done an amazing job with this. I hope that you are feeling great because this has been an amazing, amazing program tonight and you have curated an awesome opportunity. So, um, Darren, you stepping back in, I was just giving you your, your flowers and just telling you thank you for, you know, stepping in with us tonight and, and representing and not only as a sponsored organization, but also as an activist um, who's done so much for our community and truly have Black folks and sense it in your heart and everything we do. And it's, it's a tough place to be. You and I, we, we've worked, we've agreed, we've disagreed, we've pushed and pronged, but I think at the end of the day, it hurts the same when it don't happen. I think I think we both like feel that pain when, when it's like we worked so hard, we was up all night, we did all this stuff, nobody gets it. It's a thankless position to be a black activist. Whether you're working for a black organization sometime, it could feel that way, you can work for a white organization, it could feel that way on both sides of the spectrum from the employer perspective to the community perspective to the supporter perspective to the donor perspective you know um but our work is not in vain and i believe that a higher power i do believe in god and i believe god has the final say over um how we are seen and how we're perceived and what happens with our lives as a result of the work that we do paid or unpaid but uh, it would be nice to get a coin for this, though, right? People, everybody else living nice off this work. I mean, can we not be them people? <laughs> I'm just saying now. Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny that you say that. I know we're wrapping up and we've been on here for a minute, but, you know, it's, it is a thankless job, but the people who need it might be the people that mm -hmm. never get a chance to tell us that. And so that's, like, that's what my constant reminder is. I mean, Good yeah, point. we get... We get coins that do this, some of us, but you know, this is this is work that many of us were doing 
um, before there was a situation to get coins behind it, right? Because we were fighting uh, for causes, but you know, I just say, you know, them folks can hate now, but when I pass that policy next year, they're going to be mad. They really going to be trying to figure it out. They're going to be trying to figure out how this loud ass, bitchy ass, crazy ass, purple hair wearing black woman get this bill passed and my legislators couldn't because I'm the one and I'm serious about this word. And, and the white folks going to be really confused. But this, this is what I do. Like I've gotten major policy passed for people that like in this city that will never, ever, ever, ever know it's me unless we have a conversation about it. So it ain't about who know, it's about who feel it. Well, it sounds like we need to keep having more conversations like this so that people can know what's happening. Because I do think that people need to know what you're doing and it's very relevant. All right. Well, that's it. Hey, this has been an amazing uh, broadcast. Um, we're actually going to stop. We can have a little chat and hang out if we want to and have a little cocktail together. But um, we're going to sign out and end recording. Thanks, everyone, for attending.